Well, here we are for another episode of Two Geek Soup. And joining me today is my good friend, Aaron Sturgill. Aaron, say hi to the folks and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, hey, thanks for having me on, John. I, uh, so my name's Aaron, as you said. I live in Columbus, Ohio, uh, currently sunny Columbus, Ohio. And my wife and I have been married for six years. Uh, we have a dog and two cats, and I'm currently in our library surrounded by board games and role-playing games and all manner of other books. There you have it. That is like a lifelong dream for me that has been realized, as you remember probably, in one place that we lived, is to actually have a room that is, in fact, a library yeah. in my house. And I loved it, even though it was kind of like a gross room and it was moldy and I couldn't really like abide down there for like periods of time. Mm -hmm. It was still awesome to have like a library and I loved it. So that is, that's awesome. It is still the unfinished room in our home, although I have taken the time to put wall-mounted shelving around the ceiling area, so we have all of the board games and DVDs suspended way up high near the ceiling, which is super cool. And then we also have... That is cool. Yeah, it's space-saving and also just appealing, and I learned a lot about you know hanging stuff in drywall throughout that project. And then we have the bookshelves, and it's still just sort of our staging area for boxes that we haven't unpacked yet, too. So. <laughs> right. Where and where is your tack board in that in that room? Um, uh, did you say my tack board? Because yeah. I don't have that. Yeah, no, I mean the game tack, the one that I made I'm for so you and sorry. gave you. Yes, I yes, uh, I thought you had like a bulletin <laughs> board of some sort, like a you know. Pin board. Uh, tack is right Everybody right. has a pin board in their library, Aaron. <laughs> Come on. What are you talking about? Uh, tack is uh, beautifully and lovingly displayed on my gaming shelf, which is one of the vertical bookshelves where I have a 12-sided glass vase for all of my dice to sit in, and then right next to it is Tack. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've got to send you a picture. Excellent. Of I have my only... Yeah. I, the only role-playing game that I ever got as a prize at Origins is on that shelf, and then my, my most of my dice in a 12-sided glass vase, and then Tack is also on that shelf. Sweet. Yep. Yep. By the time this goes out, I don't know actually where this is going to fall in terms of our release schedule. I may or may not have talked about uh, the uh, the King Killer Chronicle uh, from whence Tack is derived. Right. Um, have you had a chance to to read any of that yet? No, by the way, I, I know I recommended no. it to you a bunch of times. I've only had the chance for more people to recommend this to me. <laughs> it just keeps awesome. Happening. Yeah, it just keeps happening, and I keep saying, "Yep." I've yeah. seen the TAC Kickstarter. I have a copy of TAC, and I keep seeing TAC for sale everywhere. And people keep saying that it's that it's the one, in the next fantasy series you need to read. Yeah, well, and as you may or may not know at this point, there is actually also a big movie adaptation of it oh, coming out. Okay. Um, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but um, have you heard of Hamilton, the the musical? The musical, yes. Yeah, so the the big guy behind that is Lin Manuel Miranda, right? His name I know, and and he is uh, an executive pr producer on the King Killer Chronicle adaptation. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it'll be pretty exciting. Awesome. So, Aaron, what was your? Um, I've been calling you with my other guests. What was your gateway drug into <laughs> into um, nerd culture and? My dad allowing me to stay up and watch Star Trek The Next Generation with him, for sure. Awesome. I was captivated by, and this is, uh, this is first season because Jordy was behind the helm and, in my earliest memories. And I was captivated yeah. by the fact that their uniforms looked like pajamas, which was super like, I'm in pajamas. These guys are in pajamas too. And they're in space. That's amazing. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then I, I would uh, I would go over to our mutual friend Chad's house and have my first experiences with LARPing up in his attic, where his dad of course yes. helped him construct a uh, pretty awesome sort of bridge play area with props and control panels and stuff. That was amazing. Yeah, like the that was amazing. Our our friend Chad is one of the greatest Star Trek nerds ever, yeah. and he did in fact have like. Yeah, they had they built like a little 
prop warp core mm-hmm. and he had like panels that popped out and you could see all the isolinear circuitry behind it and it, it was truly amazing. It was. It really was. His dad built him a Type 2 phaser from nothing but his memory of the show in his uh, workshop. And then the last yep. thing they did, which was before you could get one at Target, right? This is long before Playmates released the props that they would have oh, yeah. released. And then the last thing they did there before they moved out was a Jeffrey's tube. And that Jeffrey's tube was just as impressive as the warp core. I mean, it was just tucked away in a corner and you had to crawl into it, but it was super cool. Anyway. Yeah. See, it never occurred because I had, you know, our sort of Starfleet adventures with Chad in that space, too. But it never occurred to me before you just said this to call it actually LARPing. Because, yeah. Yeah, well, because LARP actually has like rules and stuff. And like you're, you're, it's not just like I'm pretending to be this thing. I'm actually, it's, it is in fact a, a a game with, with a structure and, and, and so on. Absolutely. I only call it that. Yeah, this was more like the... Sorry, go ahead. No, I only call it that in, in like, the childhood sense that playing cops and robbers is like role-playing. That's all. (laughs) Right, sure, yeah. And that's what I was going to say. This was more like the geek version of Cowboys and Indians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Star Trek was my gateway to geekery, and that was pretty much it. Yeah. Now, what is your what is your earliest like clear memory that you like sort of can can still bring up today of like the earliest like super like the earliest really geeky thing that you can remember? Was there a specific episode of Next Gen that sort of has stuck with you from the first time you saw it or or anything like that? I think I was scattered all over the place in my experience of Star Trek. There were various VHS episodes and films available at the local library that we sort of piecemealed together. My dad would not allow me to see Wrath of Khan until I had seen the original series episode that prefaced it, uh, the oh, Space Seed. Yeah. So it took years for us to find a VHS copy of Space Seed to <laughs> enable me to get the context for Khan. And then he was finally able to let me see Wrath of Khan. And that, to this day, has led to a an aspect of my personality, which is um, completionist and having to watch things in the correct order. Uh, that is completely insane. That is so funny. And I had yeah. another one of my first uh, uh, guests uh, was a, a friend here who's who's uh, first real like uh, experience with geek culture was his mom taking him to see Spider Man. And at that time, I cool. you know mentioned to him, and and now I say again, like, isn't it just sort of like the geek dream that your parents like actually understand this stuff that you're into? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's really it's great. Funny you mentioned that because it is funny you mentioned that because the defining geek moment where I knew there was really no turning back was my first convention uh, attended, which was that which featured. Marina Sirtis, uh, Counselor Troy from Next Generation, and my dad took me. I was like 10, and wow. I couldn't believe that he would let me do this. And it was at the fairgrounds, uh, and there were people dressed up as Borg, and I only had a vague notion of what a Borg was, but their costumes were awesome. Yeah. And my dad bought me an Enterprise model kit, and I realized then, like, yeah, I kind of have an ally in this, and any future geek obsessions that I have in my life, I mean, he knows who to blame for that. <laughs> That is so. funny. And that's that's really interesting because that is totally like the opposite of my experience growing up with like geeky right. interests because I – first of all, let me just say that I love my father beyond all reason. Like of he course. is an incredible, incredible man and – and I would not be the person that I am today if not for just the the many, many excellent ways that he has built into my life. And uh, often when when I pick up the phone to, to answer a phone call and there's any chance that it could be somebody who's actually looking for my dad, frequently they will be confused because mm-hmm. we, yeah. we sound very, very similar on the phone. Mm-hmm. And I've actually, as a as a gag, I've answered phone calls as him, you know, just to sort of <laughs> mess with the person on the other end of the phone that I knew was calling. But um, yeah. that having been said, <laughs> I I have I have sort of, I've been. Uh, 
persecuted is really not the right word <laughs> for for what it right. for what it was that that uh, you know it was it was sort of just this sort of um uh, benign dismissal or dismissiveness mm-hmm. of of everything mm-hmm. you know fantastical um that I was into and and, and am into still um yeah on on his part and so that was that was the struggle and so of course you know i and i'm really like in terms of being interested in geeky stuff i'm very much the black sheep of my family nobody else in my entire immediate family has has any interest in in this stuff at all one time i was able to cajole my younger brother into coming and uh and coming to a D &D session with me um, because he just yeah. kn- he knew everyone else that was there, and so it was kind of more just like a hangout. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's interesting. So now at this point, yeah. Aaron, what would you say your like major like geek inclinations are? What's your geek specialty? Uh, it's it's still Star Trek. I am well versed in the official canon and the non-official canon. I haven't read every novel, but I've read a few. Mm-hmm. And then, aside from Star Trek, it's pretty much role-playing games. Yeah. And it's and role-playing games and uh, and HP, HP Lovecraft, which we may get to on, on this show or another show. Um, yeah. And but, we can we could definitely... I think we probably could go ahead and talk about Lovecraft some as a precursor to... Um, to talking to my brother, our jock eye for the nerd guy, about uh, Lovecraft as well, um, just to see how how utterly confused he can uh, he, he'll be when we when we start to talk about those things. But um, yeah, good. yeah, Lovecraft is is uh, it is weird, and and that actually is like that's that's sort of like the title of that that genre a little bit, isn't it? You could call it cosmic horror, and it's also called weird fiction, isn't it? It is. It is. H.P. Lovecraft's tales were originally published in a magazine called Weird Tales. And at the time, that was just an appropriate moniker, because sometimes they were horrific, sometimes they were science fiction, but whatever they were, they were mind-boggling. Yeah. I think... uh, I'm trying to recall... Oh, wait a minute. No. Now I recall very, very clearly my first encounter with the work of H.P. Lovecraft. My cousin... uh, My cousin David in Canada had a, a collection and maybe he had a couple volumes of these like uh, soft cover um, collections of Lovecraft's stories and mm-hmm. and he was kind of into them and I you know just looking at the covers I was not interested because it looked mm-hmm. it looked terrifying and I've never been sure. a guy who's into like horror and stuff and I just I I didn't want anything to do with it but he um he picked out a story that was that was not really like very very awful about a guy who gets lost in a cave and encounters yeah. like something in the cave and manages to 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 kill it um it was you know it's like hairy and bestial and and all of this stuff and eventually he's rescued and they they go and find the creature that he killed and it turns out that it was another person that had gotten lost in the cave, you know, a, a long, oh, yes. long, long, long time ago. What a twist. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. And so, cool. yeah, I, I remember I remember that story very, very clearly, even though I'm, I'm sure it was, oh, it was certainly 20 years and more ago that I read that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and since then I've, I've sort of become more familiar with, with his work. Um, tor.com has a, uh, has been running a reread of, of his work and the, and the work of other authors who have been influenced by him, uh, for actually, I think it's probably been running for a couple of years now. So I've been reading those, uh, synopses and analyses. And so I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on a lot of, his themes and and sort of the major, um, yeah, things that are going on in his uh, oeuvre. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah. but tell us a little bit about your your experience with Lovecraft. Uh, 
first of all, I wish I'd known about that tour coverage. I think I need to go back and read some of that. There are a lot of his stories I'm not familiar with, but I have 